The Sex.com Chronicles, Chapter 5. What Moral High Ground? At that breakfast meeting with Steve Sherman, one of my pointed questions was whether we'd seize the moral high ground in the case. Steve seemed perplexed. His face twisted into a mask of near disgust. What moral high ground, said Steve. This is pornography. He seemed revolted by the perverse nature of the question. I learned something there. Gary's lawyers were weak because they were apologizing for the case. They were ashamed of their product. They didn't want to be seen in public with sex.com. I pointed out to Steve in California speak that theft was immoral, like, uh, thou shalt not steal. Steve rolled his eyes. But besides the fact that Cohen was a thief, there was a far more valuable moral high ground to seize. In 1999, Gary was not, and had never been, a pornographer. It was entirely unfair for Gary to be tarred with the porno brush simply because Cohen had chosen to make Sex.com the cornerstone of international online sex sales. When I met him, Gary was a bit ashamed of the case. He preferred to make money in regular business. He was a business consultant and a new technology engineer. He'd been written up in Forbes magazine and other publications as a tech visionary. He wanted to sit down with venture capitalists and corporate attorneys to craft billion dollar deals. He didn't want to have to explain that one day in May 1994, his dirty little mind had told him to register sex.com. More importantly, he didn't want to talk about how he was willing to fight to regain control of the name, presumably to get his hands on that porn revenue. Cohen, of course, had no compunction about being the king of sleaze. Covered in slime, he extended the warm hand of greeting to Gary. Come, he seemed to invite. Join me in the mud to fight for the queen of sleaze. Cohen was confident that Gary would eventually slink away like a John whose wallet is stolen by a prostitute. And this, I learned, is the great achievement of a good confidence man. His victims go quietly to avoid humiliation. We had to escape the stigma that attached to sex itself, which made Gary and Cohen look, as I told Steve and Gary, like two junkies fighting over a dime bag. Your average judge or juror might throw up his hands and say, Who cares? It'll kill you both. Gary had to get out of the business of slandering himself by the very act of pursuing the lawsuit. Having read Gary's deposition carefully, I knew there was no testimony about how Gary would have developed the site if Cohen hadn't stolen the name. During two days of depositions, Cohen and NSI's lawyers never asked Gary what he would have done with the site. I assume this was because they just thought like Steve Sherman. Of course Gary would have turned the site into a porn portal. There were no documents indicating that Gary intended to create a porn site. Attached as an exhibit to Gary's deposition, there was just one scribbled page of a business plan in Gary's typical scrawl with references to sex workers and other vague terms on it. I read those deposition transcripts carefully, and in the end I was comfortable. My plan could proceed without risk of contradiction. We were free to announce to the world what was obviously the case, but everyone had overlooked that Gary Kremen the Stanford MBA and internet visionary, the originator of Match.com, the world's largest matchmaking site, would have developed Sex.com as a public health, woman-friendly site a la Dr. Ruth or DrCoop.com. And when that fetched a belly laugh, we hit him with a backup punch. Don't laugh. It would have made good business sense, because if instead of invest harvesting a few million porn dollars, Gary would have developed a public company and harvested hundreds of millions of dollars. In mid-1999,